47 through 43. Even after Jesus had done all these miraculous signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was fulfilled the word of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message? And whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe. Because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and deadened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said, this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they could not confess their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. For they love praise from men more than praise from God. So be it. That's from Satan. That's not from God. God never changes. You can see that truth in His Word. So He is just. He is holy. But He's also merciful and loving also. But if you start believing that, that God is not the God of the Old Testament, then you say, how could a loving God send someone to hell? When the exact opposite is true, how could a loving God not send someone to hell? So that heaven, when we go to it, will be a perfect place that we will spend eternity with God and it won't be tainted. The reason this world is tainted is because we rebelled against that mighty, indescribable, uncomparable God. 
And yet He still loves us. And He loves us enough, and I know I say it over and over again, that He gave His only begotten Son. But again, we kind of just say, thank you, I appreciate that, and we go on with our lives the way they are. Rather than saying, wow, that's how much God loved us? Did He let His Son die for us? I guarantee you, if it cost my son his life to save you, that I would expect a little bit from you. How much more does an indescribable, uncomparable God expect you to give your life up for Him? And Jesus is clear about that in His Scriptures. The Word made flesh and dwelt among us. That is Jesus. And He tells us, You cannot be my disciple unless you come and follow after me. If anyone wants to be my disciple, they must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow after me. If anyone takes and puts his hand to the plow and starts plowing and looks back, he's not fit for the kingdom of heaven. So how could we ever sit there and just say, God loves us and I'm fine, I'm saved and I know it, and I'm just going to sit here and do nothing about it. Shouldn't our life be a sweet offering a fragrance to God because of the love that He's given us through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I mentioned some of the things that God is already. He's a creator. He's powerful. He's Lord. He's judge. He's merciful. He's holy. He's truth. Did I mention He's faithful? He's gracious. And He's sovereign. What does that mean to you? Think of a king maybe. But He's the King of kings. He reigns supreme. No one, not Satan, Satan doesn't have a, a prayer against God. No one reigns with God, including myself, yourself. But yet we think we co-reign with God. Because we say, oh Lord, why did you let this happen in my life? Like he's supposed to bow down to our will and our desires rather than, oh Lord, what can I do giving my life to you and to your service? especially for what you've done for me through Jesus Christ. Sovereign. From Christianity.com, there's an article that says, What does the praise, the phrase, I'm sorry, God is sovereign really mean? It's answered from a book by Chip Ingram called Why Do You Worship God? And I'm just going to read some of that right now. If you were to look up the word sovereign in the dictionary, you would find words and phrases like superior, greatest, supreme in power and authority, ruler, independent of all others. But the way I like to explain God's sovereignty best is simply to say, God is in control. How many times do you question that? Are you really in control, God? This is happening to me and everything. When you have no idea the dynamics of what's happening and how God is going to use it. And you cling to that verse in Romans 8 where all things work together for those who love the Lord, right? But you still don't understand and you still question why. And it's okay to question why, because then you'll search your scripture even more to find out that He is sovereign, that He is in control, and that He loves you so much. And that should make you want to start a fire in your soul so that you proclaim the love of God to others, that you want to give your life in humble service to Him, even as Christ gave up heaven and was a humble servant before you. And we're going to get into John 13, where Jesus sets that example by washing the disciples' feet. And he says, this I have done for you, so do this to others. God is in control. There is absolutely nothing that happens in the universe that is outside of God's influence and authority. Nothing. There's people out there today that will tell you, religious experts, that tell you that God just picks up the pieces and rolls with them. That's a lie from Satan again. God is in supreme control. So when anything ever happens to you, you know that God is in control and He loves you. As a father, a good father, the best father, loves and adores his child and wants the best for them. I'll give you an example and I'll get back to the article. If I knew that Kira falling off the steps, well, she's my granddaughter, let me use Jacob again, but he's big now, he, fall, he fell down a lot. <laughs> and we let him fall in cases like that and he got hurt and it was sad. But if, that, if I knew sovereignly that falling down the steps would keep him from falling out the second story window and breaking his neck next week, I would gladly let him fall down the steps. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. We don't know what God knows. We don't know His plans. 
Joni Erickson and Tata says that if she was not in the wheelchair, had the, the, the tragedy happened to her that she had, she would not have faced God like she should. And people ask her, what about your God? Can He not save you? And she says, He has saved me by confining me to this wheelchair so that I give up my life to serve Him. See, that's the difference in how we view things. There is absolutely nothing that happens in the universe that is outside of God's influence and authority. As the King of kings and Lord of lords, God has no limitations. Consider just a few claims from Scripture about God. Revelation 21, 6. God is above all things and before all things. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is immortal. He is present everywhere so that everyone can know Him, believe in Him, have a relationship with Him. Colossians 1.16, God created all things and holds all things together, both in heaven and on earth, both visible and invisible. God knows all things past, present, and future. There is no limit to His knowledge, for God knows everything completely before it happens. Romans 11.33 God can do all things and accomplish all things. Nothing is too difficult for Him. He orchestrates and determines everything that is going to happen in your life, my life, America, throughout history, throughout the world, in the future and in the past. Whatever He wants to do in the universe, He does, for nothing is impossible for Him. Jeremiah 32, 17. God is in control of all things and rules over all things. He has power and authority over nature, earthly kings, history, angels, and demons. Even Satan has been given dominion and authority by God to bring God glory. Wow. Psalms 103, 19. That's just a glimpse of what sovereignty means. It means being the ultimate source of all power, all authority, for everything that exists and ever will exist. Only God can make those claims. Therefore, it's God's sovereignty that makes Him superior to all other gods and makes Him and Him alone worthy of our praise and worship. Just as peasants always bow down before the king for fear of offending the one who has authority and control in their life, God's sovereignty compels us to bow down before Him. But unlike corrupt earthly kings who abuse their authority and power to terrorize, God rules in love. Ah, now we see a correlation here, Old Testament and New Testament. That God of the Old Testament who wipes out nations, but for His glory and honor, and we don't know the whole picture. And Old Testament foretells over and over of a Savior because we can't save ourselves. We can't adhere to the law. God rules in love. He loves you and wants the best for you. Romans 8.28 promises that all things God works together for good to those who love Him and who have been called, called out of this world, the church, Ecclesia, according to His purpose, to present the gospel message, to be a living sacrifice, to love one another, even our enemies. That's an amazing promise, not only because it demonstrates that an all-powerful God cares about you and me, but because it cannot be fulfilled unless the one who gives it is all-knowing, all-wise, all-powerful, and all-loving. The promise itself is a testimony of God's sovereignty. Now take that in mind a minute and think about the passage that we just had and what Jesus has been saying. And that He came in to Jerusalem as a King of kings, Lord of lords. That the, the world recognized that, but days later He would be crucified, nailed to a cross because of his claims that he was God, that he was the Messiah, the promised one, despite all of the signs, the wonders, the miracles that he did. And Jesus quotes Isaiah. So who is Isaiah? Well, he's an Old Testament prophet that lived about 700 years before Jesus. He's quoted over 50 times in the New Testament. His name means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. That's ironic, isn't it? 700 years before, and they're quoting him now. And if you don't know it, and Jesus says it over, uh, over and so do the apostles, all the prophets were killed in Jerusalem, the, the, the city of God, the holy city, because they didn't want to believe what the prophets had to say unless what the prophets had to say was what I wanted to hear. Then it was okay. But if it wasn't something that I wanted to hear, then we persecuted and killed the prophets. We've already seen John the Baptist beheaded in this book of Revelation of John, the Apostle. 
And Jesus has gone to Jerusalem so that they will crucify the prophet of all prophets, the Messiah, the chosen one of God. <clears throat> Isaiah has prophecy after prophecy after prophecy of this one who would be coming. This one who Jesus said, I am that one. Could Isaiah have meant someone else? Did he really mean Jesus? Maybe, just maybe, he meant someone else. If you look at some of the religions out there, that's what they say again. That they didn't really mean Jesus. Even the Jews rejected Jesus. But here's what Jesus says. Do you remember the scandalous woman at the well from John 4? We've already read about it getting to John 12. Here's what is recorded in John 4 verses 24 and 25. Jesus says who he is and says, if, if you want living water, you would come to me. And she doesn't understand. The woman said this, I know that the Messiah, the one called the Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Verse 26, then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. What did Jesus claim? We have the I am statements of John. Jesus claimed that he was God, that he was the Messiah that He was the way, the truth, and the life. That if you are His sheep, you'll listen to His voice and enter through Him the gate. And if you want to experience life, you'll cling to the vine. Because without Him, you cannot grow. You cannot have life. No matter how much you think you believe and fool yourself. Because if you truly believe, a fire will start and you will profess and you will give honor and glory to this God that we've just talked about. This God who is above all other gods who created and designed you to bring Him glory and honor. And then after you rebelled, gave up His Son's life to redeem you back. Wow. So here we are to John chapter 12, verse 37 to 43. That's our scripture from this morning. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence... Israel, the Jews, and the Gentiles, because they're there now, they still would not believe in Him. Who He was, why He was here, and what our call is to be disciples of Christ. Don't forget that part. That part gets wiped away. So many pastors don't want to preach that because then that requires something of you. Well, I want to go to church and just have the feel-good stuff. I don't want something required of me. We're studying in our Sunday school class, and, in, and I don't remember the different things, but it says, what keeps you from wanting the Holy Spirit to have authority and power in your life? And I remember the third one, and each and every one of us that said something in our Sunday school class said, yep, that's mine. We're afraid of what the Holy Spirit might ask us to do. Because we're still on the throne. We want what we want. And when we cry out and pray, it's because, God, how did you, why did you let this happen in my life? Instead of, Lord, I give you authority every single day of my life. Verse 38, this was to fulfill the words of Isaiah the prophet. Now, see why I gave you a little bit of background and who Isaiah is. That God is sovereign, He's supreme. And whenever the Spirit comes on an Old Testament prophet, he proclaims the word of the Lord. The Spirit is on everyone here that believes so that you can proclaim. Remember Acts? When they said, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel at this time? And Jesus said, you don't need to know these things. But here's what you do need to know. You will receive power when the Spirit comes upon you and you will proclaim. You will be my messenger. That's your part of this deal. I am going away, and now you are the proclaimers. You are the prophets of the Old Testament. You are the saints. You are a royal priesthood gathered together. You are the church, those called out to proclaim the gospel message. Not to just come on Sundays and, and get a little feel-good message, but to get equipped to tell the world about Jesus Christ and the love that you have because God loved you first. This was, was to fulfill the words of Isaiah the prophet. What words? Lord, who has believed our message? <laughs> the message that Jesus teaches plainly. 
The message that got Jesus crucified. The message that Jesus said, if you follow in my footsteps, don't be surprised if you get persecuted also. Oh, that's what I'm signing up for. And Jesus is clear. He tells you to consider the cost. Who in the world would not consider what it costs to build the building before they start into it or the battle that they're fighting? Lord, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He's quoting from Isaiah 53, verse 1. For this reason, they could not believe. What? I don't, I don't get that. They could not believe? I thought we had choice. But see, there's a point when you keep rejecting and rejecting and rejecting that God doesn't come to you anymore. And without God coming to you, you can't have salvation. And in this day and age, in the church age, the arm of the Lord has been revealed to you. His mighty power. That's what that's to, uh, alluding to. The arm of the Lord that parted the Red Sea, that showed His glory among the nations, especially to the nation that was above all nations at that time, man's power, Egypt. To the Pharaoh who was God. You realize that Egyptian gods and goddesses, Pharaohs are gods. <laughs> but they're not a god compared to our god. And He hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would serve his purpose and his will. Not because God is a bad God, but because we rejected him for so long that he said, you're blinded. Your hearts are hardened. Well, wait a minute. God did that, but yet didn't I do it to myself by continually rejecting God? We'll get into that more later. For this reason they could not believe, verse 40, because God Himself has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. So there was a point for sure when I could have, but I rejected over and over and over again. I kept saying, but Lord, but Lord, but Lord. Then I couldn't anymore because my, my eyes were blinded and my heart was hardened. But Jesus came to heal the blind, to set the captives free. He's quoting from Isaiah 6.10 here. Write that down, remember that. Isaiah 6.10, because it's going to come up again in a minute. Verse 41, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory. Remember what Jesus said early? Glorify thy name. And a voice from heaven came and says, I have glorified my name, I will glorify my name. Even when I said to wipe out nations. Don't know how or why, but hey, I can go with it. Have you seen Jesus' glory? Verse 42, Yet at the same time, many among the leaders believed in Him, believed in Jesus. Yay! But let's read on. But because of the Pharisees, kind of like the church in that day, they were the religious leaders, the religious institution, for whatever reason and excuse, they would not openly acknowledge their faith. Are you openly acknowledging your faith, telling of the love of Christ that's in you? Theirs was for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. And we saw that with the, the mother and father who wouldn't even talk about their son who was blind from birth and healed now. Because they were afraid of what man would do for them. But the man himself said, I'll tell you, it's Jesus. I don't even know who he is yet, but I'll tell you. And when they kept on questioning him, he said, do you want to become his disciple also? Do you want to follow after him? Because you've seen the wonderful signs and miracles that he's done. All I know is I was born blind, but now I can see. Verse 43, well, that sums it up, doesn't it? They loved human praise more than praise from God. You can put glory in there if you want to put glory in there also. Turn in your Bibles to Luke 7. And I say turn there because we're going to go through a, a lot of Scripture. Okay? Remember that Luke was written because you already believe. I want you to know what you believe so that you can apply it to your life. Where John was written so that you might believe. So we're going to skip back over to Luke. Luke 7, starting in verse 36. When one of the Pharisees, we just talked about who that is, the religious pretender, an actor, a hypocrite, Regardless of what they say they believe, their heart's far from it. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. 
A woman in that town who had lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed, kissed them, his feet, not kissed him, kissed his feet, and poured perfume on, perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had, Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, here's this man's true heart, his true belief, his true spiritual condition. If this man were a prophet, uh-oh, prophets of old, prophets of new, the Spirit of God has come upon him. Not only is Jesus a prophet, but he's the prophet of all prophets. He's the one the prophet spoke about. He is the Messiah. If this man were a prophet in my own mind, in my own heart, he would know the sinful woman that's touching him. But is that what Scripture teaches us even before Jesus came on the scene? Jesus sums up the law when He says you need to love the Lord your God with everything you have and love your neighbor as yourself. That sums up the Ten Commandments. That sums up all the law. Everything that the words of the prophets hung upon, that sums it all up. If this man were a prophet, he would know who was touching him and what kind of woman she is. Let's be clear that she is a sinner, <laughs> unlike me. Jesus answered him, Simon, whoop, directly, Alan, put your name in there. I have something to tell you. Listen up. A personal appeal to you. And he answers, tell me, teacher. Why do you ask a teacher a question unless you want the answer that they're going to give you? You have, that have taught know that. And you know the difference in the students who genuinely ask it and those who don't. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50 Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he gave the de forgave the debts of both. Now, what's, which one of them will love him more? And before I go on, I want to mention here, you have a debt. The debt that you have for sinning against God is eternal separation from God in a place called hell. And Jesus paid that price so that you could have life and follow in His footsteps and have abundant life. You may not realize it because you might not think your debt was as much. But let's go on to see what, what Jesus says here. Simon replied, I suppose the one, neither, uh, start verse 42, neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose, he knew, the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. Because see, Simon thought he was righteous. He thought the woman was a scornful sinner. So he didn't need as much saving grace. But we all need Jesus' saving grace. Jesus said, you have judged correctly. Judged. Remember in John 12 where Jesus says, judgment has come? And he also goes on to say, I'm not the judge at this point because I've come to save. But there is a judge. He's the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and anything else that he testifies to. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? Look carefully at this one you call a sinner. I, the Messiah, not just a prophet, came into your house. Now recognize these of you being you, Simon, versus being she, the, the scornful woman. You did not give me any water for my feet. That was customary to wash the feet of the guests. But she instead wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss. It was a customary greeting, especially for a prophet of God. But this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil. Again, customary for a man of God. But she has poured perfume even on my feet, wasted it in the Pharisee's eyes. Oh, wait a minute. That sounds familiar. We'll get to that in a second. Therefore, concluding this, I tell you, listen up again. Her many sins have been forgiven 
as her great love has shown, her works, her faith in action, whatever you want to call it, verifies her true heart's faith. Oh, there's that word, but. As for you, Simon, hopefully you can't put your name in here. Whoever has been forgiven little loves little. And the reason I said that earlier, what you have to be forgiven of is sinning against an indescribable God. And the only way to pay that debt is faith and trust in Jesus Christ, which is free but not cheap. Verse 48, Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Now, how do you understand where this peace and joy can come from that you can't have anywhere else? You know that you have eternal life. You know that you belong to God. Not only do you belong to God, but you are His child. Verse 49, The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Could this be the Messiah? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith, your belief, your trust, your commitment because of your belief has saved you. Now go in peace. Now keep on reading in Luke 8 as a continuous story, except their first three verses are those funny verses, if you remember them, that we talked about on Mother's Day. Because they're like, wait a minute, we kind of leave the story. But we're going to read them here. After this, after this time, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. That's what he's been doing. The twelve were with him, and also some women, who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, one called Mary Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna the wife of Susa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. Now read verse 4. While a large crowd was gathering, people were coming to Jesus from town to town, and he told them this parable. I said just a minute ago, this story reminds me of something. Does it remind you of John chapter 12? I hope it does, because we've gone over John chapter 12 for a while. In John chapter 12, verse 1, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead, where a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus among those reclining at the table. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. Sounds familiar, don't it? It's not the same person. Go study that. Okay? It's not. Just so you know that this is a different story. And the, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, who? Not a Pharisee this time. Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples. Those who claimed and walked with Jesus. Not just claimed, but his heart wasn't right. Who was later to betray him, because John's writing this after the fact. He objected to what? Mary's worship. Why isn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? Sounds good, doesn't it? But we know his heart now from reading all of it. It was worth a year's wage. If you'd have put it in the money box, maybe I could have got some of it. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. In a similar account, Matthew 26, verse 8, it says, When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. Oh, we've got similarities again, don't we? So even the disciples asked, why this waste? There's nothing wrong with asking God why, but remember whose authority He is. If you're in the military, you might question why we're doing this, but you still fall under the authority of the commander. You don't question that authority. Why this waste, they ask. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Same answer, same question. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. She's worshiping. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, noticed that that was fine for the other disciples. They're like, oh, I didn't know that. Good, let's go on. 
Even if I don't know the answers, it's not for you to know the times and seasons, but what I have done is given you the Spirit so you'll proclaim the Word of God even if you don't understand it. But Judas, one of the twelve, revealed his true belief. He went to the chief priest and asked, verse 15, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. Back to John 12. We've gone through verses 1 through what? 6? Verse 7 says, Leave her alone. Jesus cried, It was intended that she would save this perfume for the day of my burial. You think God, before you were ever even created, knew that this day was going to come? You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd, that's as back where we were reading earlier, a large crowd was coming to Jesus. A large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there, not only because of him, but to see Lazarus, one of these signs that Jesus had done. And then it goes on in John chapter 12 to say the whole world, even the Greeks, the wisdom of the world, which is foolishness compared to the message of the cross, were coming to see and worship Jesus. So let me get back to Luke 8 before I go on too far. I could go on forever, but I don't want to, do, to have you all fall asleep on me. Verse 4 said, While a large crowd was gathering, and people were coming to Jesus from town after town. See why I wanted you to see those other things tied together? He told them this parable. So let's get to this parable. Okay, A farmer. Could that be a sovereign God that we've been taught about? I say so. He went out to sow his seed, his word, that was made flesh and dwelt among us. This message of reconciliation, which you're ambassadors for. Jesus himself, God Almighty. As he scattered the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on the rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. That sounds like John 12 again. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, there won't be a harvest. When he said this, he called out, Whoever has ears, let them hear. Listen up. Very truly I tell you, if you want to be my disciple, listen. <clears throat> Let's go to our scripture. Well, let's go back a little bit before it. John 12, 20 says, Now there were some Greeks, remember I just told you this, who were among those who went up to worship at the festival because Jesus had pronounced Himself as Lord of Lord, King of Kings. The Israelites recognized that. They said, Hosanna, save, God save us. We recognize you. Some believe. Many didn't. But some believe. Oh, But then they were afraid to be exposed by the light because their deeds were evil. And they loved the darkness more than the light. And you're thinking, how could a loving God blind their hearts and minds? How could He not if He's carrying out His purpose? See where I'm going? And this is going to be a to be continued because it's a deep subject. There were some Greeks who went to worship at the festival. They came to Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to Andrew and Andrew to Philip and, and Philip to Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, I'm going to, and if you are my follower, you will also. It remains only a single seed if it doesn't. But if it dies, it produces many seed. That good soil that we were talking about in our previous passage. Anyone who loves their life, really wants eternal life, will lose this life. While at the same time, anyone who hates their life in this world, the things that this world can provide them, the money, the fame, the prestige, whatever it is, if you literally hate it so that you'll give it up, 
will keep it for eternal life. I was talking to Michaela yesterday because she's reading in Kings. And I'm like, why, why are you reading in Kings? <laughs> I'm not studying Kings. This is Old Testament. I'll try to answer your questions. And, and the Spirit helped answer most of them. But when Elisha was called, he went back and burned everything and gave everything up. And I was like, hey, that's just like what we're learning about here. He said, I'm not going to let anything keep me. That was 700 years more than that, Elisha was. I'm thinking of Isaiah. That was further back than that. He hadn't heard Jesus' answer to the young rich ruler who said, I've kept all the law and everything. What else must I do to inherit eternal life? Go back and sell everything you have so it won't be a hindrance for you. Then you can come and follow me. But that's exactly what Elisha did because nothing was going to keep him from serving God when the Spirit of God came upon him. Verse 26, whoever serves me, Jesus has to be Lord, not just Savior. He must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor. You can count on it because the God who He is. That indescribable, uncomparable God. He will honor the one who serves me. Now I want to go back to Luke 8 and finish reading this. And we'll continue this next week. Luke 8 verse 9. His disciples ask Him, what this parable, this one of the sower and the seed, meant. He said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. Wait a minute, he's going to tell me later that I don't need to know all these things. I've given you what you need to know. The love of God through Jesus Christ, the Son. The Spirit reveals Jesus to you who reveals God because they're all one. Wow. You don't need to know all the other details. You need to know the mission that's before you. And are you signing up for this mission or not? But to others I speak in parables. <laughs> that but word. So that though seeing, they may not see. They think they do. Though hearing, they may not understand. Remember I told you earlier to write down Isaiah 6.10? Jesus is quoting here. Who's He quoting? Isaiah chapter 6 verse 9. That's coincidence. Or does it all tie together because God planned it so many years before, 700 years before Isaiah penned these words because He saw the glory of Jesus. And now Jesus is quoting them in His final words, telling you, I'm here now before you, begging and pleading for you to follow after Me. Not just believe, but follow after Me. Unless a kernel of wheat dies, then you're probably fooling yourself. You think you can see, but you're blind. You think you've heard Me, but you don't understand. See how it ties together? God is sovereign. He reigns supreme over all. And you, O oh Christian, have sinned against God. The payment for that sin is eternal death and separation for God, from God forever in a place called hell. But because God's love for you, He sent His one and only Son to pardon you. Pay the price for your freedom so that you could live as an adopted child of God. Cover to cover, that's what this says. Don't get stuck on any of the other things. And we have a mission. Do you believe this? And are you willing to put Jesus Christ as Lord of your life? Because every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So I hope and pray that you will do it now with your life. We'll talk more about it next week. Father in heaven, we thank you so much the fact that You are holy, that we know that Your judgment is fair and true, and we thank You for the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We thank You for Your Spirit that seals us as Your very own and equips us fully for the task that is ahead of us. We thank You that we have a spirit of unity that ties us all together, 
that your scripture says that iron sharpens iron. The scripture also says, let us not get out of the habit of gathering together so that we can build up one another. May our words be edifying and loving for one another. May we realize the beautiful task that lays before us of proclaiming the love of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.